What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. We are the Bros Murph, and this is the best of Board Game Geek. Ooh! That's right, it's time to talk about everything Board Game Geek in the last month. What Not people, everything, it's a big well, site. That's true, most, <laughs> like a tenth, like so, a fifth. Ultimately such a small Doesn't matter, <laughs> a portion of Board Game Geek will be talked about, mostly what games people are talking about the yeah. most, the most hot games of the month. A couple of things that we really enjoyed uh, as we were browsing yeah, a little around bit of Board news, Game Geek. You know? A little bit of Board Game Geek news. Speaking of news, Ooh. let's get down to the news right now. Segways. <laughs> So if you haven't noticed, the holidays are right around the corner and you may have seen all sorts of different channels, including us in our other lives, uh, doing gift guides and stuff. These are games we think would be great to stuff in someone's stocking and things like that. I don't know if you noticed, right there at the top of the BGG page, there's a holiday gift guide from Board Game Geek. All sorts of games that are good for families, good for friends, good for your hardcore gaming group. Every sing single person in my mind could be gifted a game this year. And so if you are looking for ideas, like what could I possibly get for someone, check out the BGG gift guide. There's always really great suggestions in there. Hop in the comments and stuff, suggest things that you think would be great and add to the kind of discourse that's going on. Cause it's really fun to use this time of year to kind of try to like evangelize our hobby a little bit and get it out in front of uh, other people. So be sure to check out the BGG gift guide right there on the front page of Board Game Geek today. For my Board Game Geek news, I'm just trying to remind you to always look at the hero page. That's the like the four or five articles that are always at the very, very top of the homepage of Board Game Geek, because a lot of times there's a lot of really cool designer-based things there. Right now, at the time of recording this, there is a designer diary for Heat, where the designer is talking about and writing out a diary about the design and the process of Heat. And it's so cool. And there's more and more and more, specifically of these designer diaries that are coming out. And they're always up there. And then on top of that, Candice, who works for Board Game Geek, does Cardboard Creations, where she interviews different designers on their games. Right now, there's one for Wonderland's War designer, Tim Eisner. And so if you haven't noticed that kind of stuff on the Hero page, make sure to check it out. Because specifically, if you like that kind of board game geek news, board game geek information, like based around designers and their thought process and how did this game come to be. There's almost always some cool stuff like that up on the hero page. So make sure to check it out. Right now there's two great ones and you gotta make sure to always check the hero page. All right, so that's two quick pieces of board game geek news. We're all here for the hottest games of the month. What has been the hotness? We're gonna find out. Let's go down to the table and talk about the hottest games of the month. All right, so this is gonna be the hottest games of the month. These games have been all over the hotness. Again, higher up ones would be ones that are at the top of the hotness for longer and stuff. Right. These are the games that people are talking about. Everyone's clicking on these, they're checking out the page, engaging checking in discourse, yeah. yeah, stuff like that. So these are the 10 most talked about games this month. Number 10 is Aeon Trespass Odyssey. Now this is a Kickstarter that's hitting people's hands right now. Correct. So everyone's kind of asking questions about rules and all this kind of stuff. So it was popping up on the hotness. As uh, it usually does, yeah. Yeah, you know, up in like the 10 area and stuff like that. But yeah, this is kind of this like alternate antiquity game where like this big like, cataclysm killed like all a bunch of the old gods, like the Zeus's and stuff like that. And you're now trying to like deal it. You're like Argonauts who are fighting these like big primordial villains and stuff yeah, like that. It's and it's like this big co-op campaign game. Yeah. Kind of dealing with like, you know, major crisis, you know, things that are happening yeah. on Earth and trying to keep it all going. But it's kind of cool to take like an already legend thing and do an alternate kind of version yeah. of a... And it seems like each campaign you're either trying to fight some big bad, some big villain, yeah. or you're trying to solve some kind of crisis, yeah. do some objectives and stuff like that. And yeah, it's got like big minis, big crazy stuff. It's again, a big mini campaign game. There's yeah. many of these games. It just seems kind of cool, like a little bit different than just the typical like dungeon crawler perhaps yeah. and stuff. It just seems like a, a theme that is like, well, that's a, an, inter an interesting story yeah, to tell. Totally. Uh, yeah, so that's Aeon Trespass Odyssey, not an Aeon's Endgame, which we originally I originally thought. thought it was, not gonna lie. But Aeon <laughs> Trespass Odyssey is number 10. Number nine's here pretty much every single month. This is Ark Nova. You Arc know, Nova people is, are still talking about it. It's well, this game's been out for a year because it came out at Essen last year, and now yeah. um, now it's out again. And Well, it's not out again, but it's, it's still it's, here. It's still being talked about. People still be loving some Ark Nova. It's great. We played it recently again, and uh, yeah, it's still fun. Yeah, it's a really fun game. You're running a zoo. Um, you are kind of, people, you know, compare it to terraforming Mars because there's kind of these tags that you will accrue yeah. of uh, different continents, different types of animals and stuff. And certain cards that you want to play might have a prereq of like, you need to have, 
uh, your, well, for one, your animal uh, action card upgraded, or you might need to have certain tags from a certain continent or a certain amount of other reptiles before you play yeah. this reptile. So there's a little bit of that comparison to Terraforming Mars. Yeah. But here you're trying to run the most appealing zoo you can by putting amazing animals uh, in enclosures and, and stuff, and then focus on major conservation yeah. efforts. Again, Ark Nova's great. It's, it takes a bunch of stuff from a bunch of different games and melds it into a really fun experience. I really like Ark Nova. Um, and it'll probably be here for a while because it's yeah. the most popular game we in a couple years. Big time fans yeah. ourselves. So that's number nine, Ark Nova. Number eight is Weather Machine. This is uh, uh, the the most recently out uh, Vita Lacerda game, yeah. which I think is now delivering to people yeah, from, yeah. Its, from its campaign. Uh, this is a game all about kind of uh, controlling the weather, trying to harness the weather, uh, you know, move rainfall over farmlands and stuff. It's kind of like what we we have for the last 150 years have been doing on Earth is we're trying to find ways to harness uh, the energy of weather and control it uh, so that we can make it useful for us versus just uh, doing whatever it do. It, it does. It's um, hard to control though. Yeah. yeah. So this game, you're kind of you're all like uh, proteges of a scientist yeah. and trying to to do that and using like bots and stuff yeah, like that. It's a super Vila cool Sarita game. It's, it's one of those Vila Sarita games. It's got a ton going on. It looks all sorts of crazy. It's got Eno Tool Art. This is probably my favorite looking of like all the big Vita Lacerda games. It looks really cool. It looks so good. Like it's just so cool. I love the theme. Yeah. Again, Vita Lacerda is one of those, I always, even though like a lot of times when we play Vita Lacerda games, I end up not like loving them, but I'm always interested. And this one too, I'm just like, I want to play with the machine so badly. Absolutely. Because yeah. it just seems cool. It just seems try cool. It. This is one where the theme to me like might help kind of propel us through the game because we're just engaged in that. It might help make it us hook into it quicker, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping. So this is one we definitely want to try. Uh, weather Machine is number eight. I want to play number seven so badly. So Mikey. bad. Heat pedal to the metal. Pedal to that medal. This is a racing game. It is. And I'll tell you right now, I've talked about this a couple times. Like It's so nice to be really excited about a Days of Wonder game again. Yeah. Because for so many years, they were just like the pinnacle of game design a lot of, in a lot of ways. And then, not that they just fell off, I just think the, the, rest the hobby kind of caught up. Kind of caught up to yeah. it. The heat sounds really, really Heat's cool. Heat's really cool. It's this racing game where you are playing out cards and stuff and kind of trying to manage your heat, which can be a resource that's useful for you, but I think it can also kind of clog yep. up your decks. There's some like deck building mechanisms and depending on what, what gear you're in, you're drawing out more cards because you're trying to go fast yeah. through this race. But the faster you go, the more kind of heat is adding to the engine and might ultimately yeah, you, get in your way and kind of stall you and out. If you run out of heat when you need to play heat, you will spin out, which is very, yeah. very detrimental. So you got you can't, you, got, you want to have some cool. heat, you don't have too much, you gotta, yeah. you gotta balance it all it out. It's made by the designer who made Flamme Rouge and apparently it's yeah. similar, but pretty different at the same time. And so it's constantly getting comp compared to that and like Formula D and stuff like that and like what's better. We haven't played, you've played Flam Rouge, but I, I haven't played, Rouge a lot. we haven't played Formula D. The first kind of the birth child of those two games. Yeah, exactly. A little so more on the Flam Rouge side. Heat seems real cool though. It just seems cool. Yeah. It's got great Vincent Detroit art. Uh, it's got like four different maps in the base game and like a couple different modules, including like a campaign kind of esque thing. There's like AIs you can use, which apparently work really well. Like I'm really excited for Heat. I'm yeah. just super pumped about so it. It's way up high on our personal yeah. anticipation list and uh, we hope to be able to run into it soon. Yeah, and people talk about it because I think people are really excited for it again. Yeah, it's nice. nice to have a racing game. Those are that common and no. to have a Days of Wonder game and obviously the Vincent trade art does not hurt. Uh, that is Heat at number seven. Indeed, it's getting to six. Number six got a new expansion, Mikey. It did. I'm very keen to try it. It's the Asia expansion for Wingspan. Yes, so I'm, I imagine that that expansion is helping boost uh, people yeah. talking about Wingspan Same in least. general. The Asia expansion is, of course, a one to two player standalone expansion that can also be incorporated into the game Which to I'm, do a couple of things. I hear it's, I hear it's pretty interesting too, yeah. I'm really curious. One thing I love about this, again, this is Wingspan on here, but I, we can assume it's the expansion It's, it's that's because people it. are talking about Wingspan. Things yeah. I love, one to two player game love. with a duet mode, which has an actual sideboard that kind of increases like what you're trying to do, what kind of bonuses you're mm -hmm. going for. Uh, and almost like, almost like a little bit of an area control on this uh, sideboard. So yeah. it makes a two player game just a little bit more tactical. Yeah, which is nice. Uh, and then also, if you want to get crazy, you can add, because now you have two more player boards and stuff, you can add those to a to your base game to make a six or seven flocking mode, no, where basically wrong. two people are taking a turn at the same time. No. I don't personally want to do that. I won't do that. But I'm so <laughs> excited for the duet version. And the thing I love yeah. is that this is standalone. If yes. you just want to try Wingspan. You sure can, yeah. You have enough. Uh, 
content to play a solo or two player game all on its own. And yeah. I think that is such a smart move. And then if you want to add it, you just, it's just more bird cards. And you can just bring those cards in and, and you're good like, to go. Yep, uh, that's what I want. Yeah, I'm very so curious. Excited. I'm very, I already like Wingspan solo a lot. I actually might even prefer it solo. And so yeah, it's like a one to two player. So I'm curious how the solo is for this one. I'm yeah. really excited. I like Wingspan. I like getting more stuff. Just give me more birds. Let me have more weird broken bird engines. That's all I want in life. That's all we've ever um, wanted. And so, yeah, I'm really excited about this one. Absolutely. That's number six is Wingspan. Number five, I've been seeing all around BGG because there's like advertising for it. People on content groups are making for it. This is pests. They're making nice content light for it. little game. Nice light about little the plague. game about the plague. <laughs> yeah, so there's like this big plague happening, and it's got that kind of like old school like plague like bird the bird beak mask. Yeah, helmets, like creepy, which I actually, man. I've always really loved that look. That it's just, me too. It's just very. Kind so of haunting yeah, it's and, very and evocative, horror haunting yeah. looking. So this is a game where you are essentially plague doctors, and it's a competitive game where the plague is happening, and basically you are uh, doing a couple different things on your turn, and you can like move around. You're moving around the different parts of the the world essentially, and you can cure plague victims. And so you go and cure them, and if you cure yeah. them, they will then join your city. And then if they oh. join their city, then you get to use them as workers. So you can put them in buildings to like run these buildings. That's you can awesome. send them to like the main area as like diplomats and stuff like that. So you're going around curing people and then using those people. Cause now you're like, oh, now I have more population in my city. I have people who can now work these factories. Hopefully that. get, you know, get things back on the track. And you're trying to build like a big economy essentially. Yeah. And you're like, oh, and having more people means I have a bigger economy. And so it's a really interesting looking game. Again, the game looks very cool. Yeah. Um, because it's just like, again, that big bird beak plague looking yeah. thing, which looks cool. Wild. Like little 3D buildings and stuff. Yeah, it seems really cool. And just that kind of like, I love that you're, you're this kind of plague doctor. You're putting up these like kind of camps places so that you can cure people and then they come and they're like oh thanks i'll join your city now why not because that's how it works and then and then you get to use those people kind of as like workers in your city and as diplomats and stuff like that. it just seems really cool um i'm actually pretty darn interested in this one um and again i'm just like i i dig that like it's a cool thing they haven't period. done a ton of it's, no it's yeah kind of like a, a and then throughout the game, like there's gonna be more plague cards. So plague's gonna start hitting in different course, places. You're yeah, also yeah. having to like deal with that as you're it doing stuff. It seems like stuff. a bigger, heavier pandemic. It where does. It's less on like <laughs> yeah. just the pure crisis management and more into like how do you get the economics yeah. of it all. But it seems really but, uh, cool. Yeah, the idea of the plague kind of, you know, spiking up places and how you do that. And I love the fact that you like have more population to help kind of turn the tide. Yeah. Very cool. So it seems very best. cool. Yeah. Number five. Uh, you gotta be into that dark theme and you gotta be into bird mask stuff, which Boom. Nick clearly is. I like That's number five, pest. Number four is the latest game in a very popular series at this point. This is Undaunted Stalingrad. Yes. Every year they have a new Undaunted and people free. I want to try these games because people love Undaunted so much. We haven't had a chance to play them. Our good friend Paula uh, loves Undaunted, so we got to play it with her. But man, people be loving some Undaunted. Exactly. So this is just continuing on the line of, of these games and people are getting uh, big boxes and stuff. Well, they've done Undaunted Normandy, North Africa, Stalingrad. Yeah. Uh, there's a ton. Uh, Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> Not many people talk about the battles. No, I'm talking Wichita, about Wichita, Kansas, Kansas during yeah. World War II. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a great kind of card based uh, war game. So it's like a war game. I was. Having not played it, war game light, you know, doesn't yeah, get into like the nitty like gritty of like a, yeah. a chip, you know, a GMT game. So, uh, Undaunted is one that, like, yeah, people are all in on. Every time there's a new Undaunted anything, it just spikes on well, top of the hotness. And it has to be for a reason. And every so it's year, got me properly excited, even though we're not super into war themes. Yeah. And every year during the BGG Awards, the Golden Geek Awards, like Undaunted always wins like war game of the year. Yeah, two every player every, game. every yeah, single time, it just for... always wins because it's like people love Undaunted. Yeah. So I'm very curious about this. I'm excited there's more Undaunted because people love it so much. Much. And on Dante Stalingrad, it's like, all right, cool, let's yeah. go, let's do this now. It's nice to have a game be so well supported, you know, yeah. create this kind of series now. Yeah, people love it, love it, love it. So that's number four. People are super hyped about it. And it, 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 I was like, oh, there's another Undaunted. All right, cool, cool. <laughs> all right, let's get number three. Number three is hitting people's hands right now. Absolutely. This is Endless Winter Paleo it's Americans from Fantasia. We have a way up there out of the shot there. Uh, this is uh, a, a worker placement. Uh, card kind of deck building ish. Kind yeah, of, yeah. There's a, there's a deck building element to it and stuff. Game. So it's a lot, the, a little bit of area control. There's a lot of little stuff in the game. Yeah, yeah. I said during the end of the Ice Age and stuff. So in this game, you're going to be putting out your workers onto. There's only four action spots in just the base game anyway. Yeah. There's four action spots you can go to, and then you have all these cards. There's culture cards which are kind of you play down. And they have these kind of powerful game breaking type effects, and then you have your kind of standard hand of elders, which are going to give you labor. So they're going to give you action points effectively to yeah. use for whatever action you choose. And the actions are similar, simple. You can like do some hunting, uh, you can capture animals or you can eat them for food because you got to use your food to do various things on the board. Uh, or you can capture them for like a set collection element. 
you can uh, get some of those culture cards and stuff. You can, there's a little bit of an area control part to the game where you put out these little tents and you kind of put out these huts that are kind of villages mm -hmm. um, out onto the board and move them around uh, and then get some of those like elder cards and stuff. Yeah. So as you uh, put down your workers, you're gonna have you know a few actions per round and you're kind of choosing like when do I invest in an action? Yeah, because like, you're when doing do like I put down a bunch of cards, get a lot of labor, and really yeah. make use of this one. You're action. doing the hunting action, you'll get the thing, and then you can play cards for their labor. So you're saying this many people are going hunting, basically. Exactly. So the more people you have, obviously the more you can, you can do, do, the more, more times there. you can trigger yeah. an action. Uh, actions cost kind of various. But those of are the cards you do. have in the round. So you have to be like, you don't want to blow it all on one. And then what action. do you do for the, that, yeah, the next few turns? You're like, well, I don't have a lot to and do. And it's here. interesting in that way. And there's certain like elders, certain people who are are specifically better at certain things. There's like a hunter who will have more extra labor if you are using that person to go hunting kind of thing. And exactly. it's really, really interesting. There's also like a bunch of like modules that we haven't even started playing with yet. There's a ton. It's a really cool game. I actually liked it a lot. It's got a great look, Miko really art. Really great. I love the kind of frozen tundra look. I think yeah. snow is something we don't see in a ton of games. It's just like really neat looking. Yeah, uh, yeah great art. Um, and it's kind of ultimately fairly easy to get into for us, for the size of game it is, because there are only a few action spots yeah. to go to. Uh, and then you can trigger a bunch of bonuses based on your where you have your your huts out and stuff like that throughout yeah. the game during the kind of like eclipse phases. So yeah, uh, it's a big one to get into people's hands. Uh, I'm sure people are exploring lots of the modules and stuff it's right great. now. It's fun. Let's, number three is Endless Winter Paleo American. Let's get number two. It's number two. Number like no games are in snow. This game is the snow. The game snow right game now. is Frost Haven. <laughs> it is Frost a Haven. future number one game to be sure. Probably, probably. <laughs> uh, it's start. I don't think it's hitting people's hands, but starting to hit a couple content creators' hands. Yeah, and I, think I, think it's, it's, I think it's starting to deliver yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. They just, got you got a couple copies going. to content creators build that hype, but Frost Haven is I think the biggest board game kickstart I've ever remember correctly. It's like twelve million something. It's that's, right up there. It's Gloomhaven, but now in the snow. But I'm very interested in this one because one, we both like Gloomhaven, but I know yeah. this one like the seasons and like what time of year will matter, which is super I'm cool. I'm super excited for some of those like world element kind of yeah. things that are going on. And yeah, the sense of time is a much bigger piece yes. of this one. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's I don't think it's gonna be much different than Gloomhaven just in the general gameplay of it, but Gloomhaven is the number one game of all time, according to people from BGG. Yeah. And so it's just one of those things where it's like, cool. And like you've always said like, it's gonna be better because Isaac um, who designed it has had more time to just Make learn the game better and, and yeah, learn. Through all the and questions I'm sure that came up in Gloomhaven clarifications and stuff, he was able to refine the design. Yeah. So Frosthaven, again, it's like, there's no way it's not better. It's really yeah. a better, smoother <laughs> right. design for sure. Uh, and last time we had a chance to talk with him, he was talking about some of the things that he's like, yeah, yeah I wish I kind of done this in Gloomhaven. Now he has a chance to implement them yeah. here. Having certain events where you know, the time that you're that's passing in the game matters and things might come up based on how much time has passed. Yeah, and cool. like, the, like he said, the season. So I'm like, I'm really excited to like, flesh out the world in kind of more of a linear, yeah. like real way. We didn't back it, so I don't know when, if well, Someday we'll, we'll give play. it a go, man, <laughs> it, you know, but I'm We just excited. know we wouldn't get a chance to play it. We don't get the chance yeah. to play the big games like that. But uh, Frosthaven, I'm super excited for people. It's people exciting love to Gloomhaven. have it finally coming out. It is, yeah. it is. I love Jaws the Lion, I love Gloomhaven. So Frosthaven, let's go. It's it's probably gonna be here for a while, fam. Let's, just, let's be honest. Um, be ready, be ready. That's the difference too, let's get to number one. So number one was all of the hotness um, for most of the month. It's kind of petered off now, but the campaign's almost done now. Think about it. Yeah. Is uh, Elden Ring, Elden, Elden Ring, Ring the, board, the game. board game by Steamforge Games. Uh, I actually got a chance to play this a couple times. I went out to uh, the UK for their event and got to play. I actually really liked the game. Uh, I don't play Elden Ring. I've never played Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Elden Ring, any of those Blood Souls games. I think is what they're called. Um, and so I was really just there from the perspective of like a board gamer. I actually really liked it. It was cool. Uh, it doesn't play anything like the Dark Souls game, which is good in my opinion. I love the Dark Souls game. Yeah. They're fine. This one's more card based versus dice. It's more There's card no based dice combat and stuff. Yeah, and it, it's kind of big quests and stuff like that. And the quest, at least the one we play, was broken down to like two distinct tasks where you're exploring around doing stuff, completing these objectives, trying to find the big boss. And the whole second half of the game was the big boss fight. But it's very cool. The the battling is not, it's much, much more of a puzzle kind of battling where you yeah. know what the, the monster, whatever you're fighting is gonna do. And you're then trying to react to that and essentially not die and <laughs> hit them back. But you yeah. know what they're gonna do so you can plan around that. And so it was much, much more of a puzzle kind of combat yeah. rather than like, Roll some dice and see what happens. Oh no, I got hit for 50 and I didn't do anything. Yeah. There wasn't any of that, which was really nice. I actually really liked the game itself. I thought it was cool. And again, that's coming from someone who doesn't know anything about Elden Ring or really care about Elden Ring because I've just never played it. And from a strictly board game status, it was good. I don't, we didn't, we're not gonna back it because we just don't You don't play have games the tie like in that. that. But I think that's like the most important like moniker, you know, uh, marker rather is that 
it stands as outside a board of its game. IP, yeah. it, it exists and stands on its own. Yeah. You know, because you don't have the tie-ins to understand the the, the fan yeah. service, and you're like, oh, I enjoy just this game. That's a really good sign. So it's one of the things like if you loved Elden Ring, and so you got the game, but you want to play with me, who's never played it, I think you can do that. It's yeah. not going to be like, oh, if you don't like Elden Ring, you're just not going to get into it. No, it's like no, like you can just play it as that's just a nice. normal board that's game, which is ultimate, cool. That's the ultimate goal. Yeah, but it was all of the hotness because it was the the thing that people were talking about. It's a big, crazy, expensive game and stuff like that. But Elden Ring, I actually liked it. That was cool. Campaign. Yeah. Um, so that is the top 10 hottest games of the month. We're gonna quickly go through um, the most played games of the Absolutely. month. Absolutely. Because we always think this is interesting. People can log their plays on BGG. Make sure to do that, because you can affect this list. Mikey, the first one that's probably, number 10 is probably number one, ultimately, is Magic the Gathering, which was logged 4,928 times. People be playing that. We got the crew Mission Deep Sea, usually on this list at 5,056. Um, Spirit Island was at, uh, uh, no, no, sorry. Yours is 4,951. Uh, Spirit Island was 5,056. I see now. Uh, Seven Wonders Duel was at 5,112. And the quest for quest for Planet 9, the crew quest for Planet 9, rather, was 5,454. Always those two are just all over the place. People will be yeah. playing them trick-taking. Please play so many rounds back to That's back. That's the thing, right? <laughs> we got Ark Nova over here on 6,224. We have Azul, which has 6,443. Cascadia, dang, out here, 6,595. That's interesting. I feel like that kind of went away now. I know. It's right. Maybe people are getting it for the holidays I or something. I guess, maybe. And Marvel Champions has 8,368. Not to be outdone by Wingspan, again, they Spanish. release new content. People are playing it. 9,936 plays of bird watching goodness. Bird right there. watching fun. Wow. Yeah, so Wingspan will probably, it's always usually on the list or near the list, but now with the new expansion, also people can play it on Switch. You can play it a bunch of different places. Every it's place you could hope to. Pretty much, you yeah. Can play there's some Wingspan. Wingspan. So that was the most played games of the month, the hottest games of the month. Let's stand back up and let's go over some Murph picks. <laughs> And my Murph pick is by a user named Pastege who made a geek list where it's called board games for every single occasion. And I was like, what does that mean? And they actually broke down this, essentially every player count and every time and give suggestions on games in that area. So you can choose like one player, zero to 30 minutes. And you click on that one right there. It'll take you to a page that has great games for one players that play in that amount of time. And it goes zero to 30 minutes, 30 to 60, 60 to 90. And it goes all the way up and they go all the way down to 10 players. So like, look, we're gonna have six players and we wanna play a game that's like, you know, um, two to two and a half hours long. Boom, you can click on it. It'll give you a whole bunch of different suggestions. I think it's such a cool tool. And this one's for 2022, so I believe this has happened in the past as well. But man, oh man, I think this is a cool tool where you can just be like, I'm gonna have this game, I'm gonna have these amount of people, or hey, I'm just looking for more two-player games, games that are great at two. I'd love them to be like in the half hour to hour long mark. Let's look at this and have a whole bunch of suggestions for us. I think that's such a cool thing. It's a really, really cool, super useful geek list. So make sure to check it out. So my Murph pick is something that uh, makes sense for me being a new dad is by Ira Perkins, a post they made talking about advice for uh, games for three-year-olds. Now, of course, I have a six-month-old. My daughter is maybe two to three weeks away from playing her first board game. Uh, but it does get you thinking about like, okay, when they are a couple years old and stuff, what kind of games can I start to introduce? You know, there's a lot of uh, kind of, of course, hobby games that are aimed at very young kids to help with color awareness or matching very kind of like basic concepts that uh, kids are keen to develop and stuff and games can really facilitate a great way to learn, which is like one of my favorite things about board games in general. We get to learn even today and kids can certainly learn a lot. Uh, so I love that this list is all about uh, parents hopping in with their thoughts, uh, uh, offering advice uh, for kids that are sometimes even younger than three or older than three, their experiences of how it's gone, you know, the highs and the lows of that. Uh, and, and of course, suggesting games themselves. So I really enjoy the kind of the holistic view that they give you of the kind of experience as well, not just this game is good, this game should be avoided and things like that. It's been this really cool kind of uh, piece of discussion that I'm personally really invested in right now. So I'm gonna be definitely looking out for more of those things in the future. Uh, and this was a great thing to kind of get me excited for the future of having hopefully a kid who likes to play board games. So uh, that is my Murph pick.
All right, so that's some Murph picks from us. Now, before we get out of here, we always like to talk about what's a game that we really personally oh, enjoyed playing gosh. this month. I will go first while Nick It was a good uh, month. It's it was a really a good, good month. month. We played a lot of stuff. One thing that I got a chance to play was Unconscious Mind by Fantasia oh. Games. Same uh, as who made uh, Endless okay, Winter Pale Americans, which we talked about during the hotness. Uh, this is a game where you are sort of a protege students of Sigmund Freud, and you are in the early days of kind of talk therapy. Uh, and psychoanalyzing people and trying to cure them of their grief. There's kind of the general uh, people are, are grieving and hurting and you're trying to interpret their dreams to get to the bottom of what's going on with them and, and give them ultimately therapy points and bring them back to a place mm -hmm. of uh, of good mental health, which is something that uh, personally we think is very important. Everyone should be in therapy. Go Firmly therapy, believe everybody. that. Everyone should be in therapy. Uh, it's good for us all. Yeah. And uh, there's these like really cool grief cards that overlay the clients it seems themselves. Really cool. These kind of Rorschach situations, and when you get kind of about halfway typically through uh, their uh, healing and stuff, they have this moment of catharsis where you remove the grief, which is a big moment, a big hit of points for you. There's a lot going on in this game where you are treating your patients, you are managing your kind of technique tiles, which is sort of an engine building uh, ability to produce and manipulate your insight, which are your resources that you use in your therapy mm -hmm. sessions. Uh, you can go around Vienna, you're tracking down Freud and doing stuff. There's a m bunch of things. It's, it's a, a big really game. cool theme, it's though. A big game. Great art. You have dual artists and Vincent Dutrait, who does all the kind of real world stuff. Andrew Bosley does all the dream art, Makes which is sense. a really cool, I think, combination to do. Yeah. Uh, that's my pick, Unconscious Mind. That's cool, that's cool. I'm, I'm going to pick Mists over Carcassonne, which you actually ah, got to play yes. last month. You got to play Great with, game. speaking of Boring Geek, Lincoln and Nikki. Lincoln and Nikki. Uh, I got to play it uh, when I was over in the UK. I played with my good friend Matthew Jude, and we played it three times in one day. We liked it so much. This is <laughs> nice. the cooperative, kind of scary, Halloween-y um, Carcassonne. Although I play it. scary. Cutesy. I, yeah, right. It's, it's gory and horrible. <laughs> no, it's like, I, I really, really liked it. It's co-op Carcassonne. It's really, really fun to be able to like talk through your turns in Carcassonne, being like, hmm, where can I put this? Okay, maybe I'll put it over here. And then be like, oh, no, no, how about you put it over here? Because that'll help me close my road. And it's so yeah. cool because like when you close things, things like a road or a city, if both of you are in that city, you get double points. So now you're like actively trying to connect stuff with yeah. your- so everybody wins. With other people, which is super cool. And then there's these big mist pools that have ghosts in them. You're trying to like close those off to get the ghosts back off the board. But almost every tile has ghosts on it and, and it just gets really, really tough. I really, really liked it. There's a bunch of different levels for it where it can get harder and harder and harder. Oh yeah. I thought it was just outstanding. I really, really enjoyed Miss Overcard. It's really, a lot. really fun game. Could not agree more. We're happy to have it now. Yeah. You picked it up while in the UK. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, so those are a couple of picks. We want to know in the comments, what are some games that you play, new or old to you? What game kind of stood out for you this month? Uh, let us know in the comments below. Yeah. Uh, until next time, I'm Mike. I'm Nick. We are the Brothers Murph. That was the best board game geek. Bye, buddy. <laughs>